I thought I'd start by just uh, reminding you that uh, this talk combines uh, work uh, in two books, one of them, uh, one on the left called The Four Steps to the Epiphany, uh, the other one, um, a book that you don't, if you don't have on your shelf, um, you should. It's called Business Model Generation from a guy named Alexander Osterwalder. And if you're an entrepreneur, the book on the right is almost now a fundamental uh, text. Um, and I say text even though most people now have Kindles. I think there's probably a, a good startup to be had to make fake spines uh, for all the books you now have on your Kindle because there's no way to tell uh, that w w when you graduate from Stanford what you actually have read. Uh, so I, if anybody's looking for an idea for a startup, um, that's a joke. Okay. All right. So I'll, I guess in this, this class I'll have to tell you when to laugh, so I will. Um, so I also write a blog. Anybody ever see it? It's called steepblank.com. Uh, how many of you are entrepreneurs or want to be? Um, so every possible way to screw up a startup is in here, um, most of them done by me. Um, so if you want some uh, uh, stories on uh, how it was to actually build some companies and then um, you know, in the blog, I kind of expanded some thoughts about entrepreneurship since I first wrote uh, the text, Four Steps to the Epiphany. Uh, so I want to tell a few short stories today. The first one, an observation about uh, the democratization of entrepreneurship. Uh, I've been in Silicon Valley now for 33 years. Hard to actually remember the, uh, back that far, even harder to admit. But in the last 33 years, Entrepreneurship and its twin venture capital um, has changed dramatically, but subtly, um, that I don't think we've even understood how dramatic those changes are. And I thought I'd spend the first uh, part of this talk actually going through those changes and then talking about one of the techniques and one of the pieces in entrepreneurial education uh, that's been one of the catalysts of change. So I just want to remind you what some of the constraints are for startups. When entrepreneurs first came to this valley, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even the 1990s, it cost a lot of money to start a company. How many of you are in software startups? Right? Right. Um, you know, hopefully, a good number of you in software started with your credit card. But in the old days, if you were in a software business, step one was buy expensive workstations. Step two was buy expensive development tools. It cost millions of dollars even for a software company to get started pre-turn of the century. Some of this is still true in hardware domains, but it was also just an implicit fact of every type of startup. It cost millions to start a company. Two is, it took a long time to get to first customership. Engineering was done using something called waterfall development. I would spec the product, make sure it had an entirely long and perfect list of features, making sure that I got that feature list by looking at all the competitors' features, making sure mine was at least three or four longer, handing that list to engineering who would go off and go implement for something called version one, sometime months, more than likely a year or two from the day you started. This waterfall development methodology was about all we knew until the 1990s. Customers took a long time to adopt. First customers in Silicon Valley were government su subcontractors. They did not buy in days or weeks. It took months, if not years, to get an order. The next wave of customers in Silicon Valley were companies. Again, these were long sales cycles and the number of customers for Silicon Valley companies could have been measured in hundreds, maybe thousands. High startup failure rate. For 40 years, the implicit notion was that startups are smaller versions of large companies. And that 
all you did in a startup, in your board meeting, reporting to your board, was focus on your execution of the business plan that your VCs had bought into. Here's what we're supposed to do. Here's when we were supposed to ship. Here's the orders we're supposed to get. Here's the revenue we're supposed to have. And by the way, there were a limited number of these VCs. 3,000 Sand Hill Road, there's maybe 20 of them up to about 1975. That was it. They all wore white shoes, looked like they just came off the boat, you know, nice press pants, all went to the same school. Um, very small ecosystem. And not only was it 3,000 Sand Hill Road, it was limited to a few regions. 3,000 Sand Hill Road, Menlo Park, California. You wanted money, that was the address. So what's happened? What's happened is something kind of interesting. These were all constraints on limiting the number of startups, certainly in Silicon Valley. I'll observe in the last five years, almost all of these constraints, certainly for the wave of internet, commerce, and social networking companies we've seen, have been eliminated all at once. Let me tell you why. Startup constraints have been replaced by what I call an entrepreneurial explosion. Now the cost of getting to a first product can be developed, if you're doing a software company, on inexpensive PCs, Macs, using open source software. The cost of starting a company is no longer measured in millions, it's measured in your credit card limit. The short time for first product. It no longer takes years to develop a product using an agile development methodology. That is a software methodology that allows you to develop incrementally and iteratively. Now says you could get a minimum viable product or a core part of your product out the door in weeks if not months, or months if not weeks. Fast customer adoption. Our customers are no longer only the government and corporate, Silicon Valley has now turned to consumer applications. Whoever thought Facebook would have had a half a billion customers? That would have been science fiction. Science fiction. Think about a Silicon Valley company with a half a billion customers. In how many years? Three, four? Unbelievable. Lower startup failure rate. Startups until the last five or 10 years have been a hit or miss proposition. When we talked about the people, we talked about having great board members, but we really didn't understand the first line. Big insight in the last couple of years is no, startups are not smaller versions of large companies. Probably if you take away anything from this talk, that's it. Everything you learn, how many of you were in Stanford uh, GSB, in the business school? Great. Everything you learn in the business school about large company management is destructive for an early stage venture. Big idea. It's not kind of useful, or gee, I'll just change it. What you'll hear later, and I'll explain why, it's destructive. Good news is, in the entrepreneurial group at GSB, we teach the right things about early stage ventures, but they are not interchangeable. And you'll hear me say this throughout this talk, large corporations execute existing business models. Startups search for them. The tools needed, techniques needed, the people needed for execution versus search is what we now know to be radically different. Understanding those rules is what the rest of this talk will be about. But let me just finish the circle. We now have a much larger pool of risk capital just in Silicon Valley. I couldn't even put all the names on here. There's been an explosion in the last 20 years, and even more so in the last five or 10, of the pool of available capital. Seed rounds, super angels, larger pools of venture capital, all have kind of exploded. And where venture capital and entrepreneurship was li limited to technology clusters like Silicon Valley, we can now easily say 
just as easy to start a company as in Manuel Park as it is in San Francisco, New York, Shanghai, Israel, Chile, Singapore, Finland, etc. While still the highest concentration of technology innovation in the U.S. is here, because basically we're a company town, meaning our cluster does nothing but this. Now, there are other clusters that are forming in multiple cities. So this talk is going to be about one of those pieces of the explosion, about what we now know about how to lower startup failure rate. And that's the purpose of the talk. Um, the next story about that starts with this notion that not all startups are equal. Now, I've been in Silicon Valley for more decades than I care to remember, or actually possible to remember by now. Um, but one of the things that surprised me teaching at Stanford was going into a classroom of some other professor and hearing them talk about entrepreneurship and who an entrepreneur was, and with the shock of me re not recognizing who they were describing. Because it turns out, if you get three professors in the room to try to define startups and entrepreneurship, you'll get nine definitions, um, including I'd throw four of them in myself. It dawned on me that we really lacked a common language of who's an entrepreneur, what's a startup. Even more important now that our government has decided to get involved with entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and startups. In fact, I tend to panic hearing that the Labor Department is going to have an occupational code for entrepreneur. We should all like figure that, the, that it's about the time that entrepreneurship has jumped the shark. Um, but I want to give you my definition of the types of entrepreneurs there are. You know, there are small businesses in the United States that are entrepreneurial. My parents came to the United States as immigrants in steerage, bottom of a boat passed under a Statue of Liberty, came through Ellis Island, lived in the Lower East Side of New York, and their dream was to open their own grocery store. That was their dream, American dream. Be self-employed, not work in the garment district, you know, be able to do what they wanted to do. Ten years later, they managed to scrimp and save enough money that they did. And their job was to serve known customers with a known product and feed the family. And their exit criteria for them being a startup was they were finding a business model. Their business model consisted of understanding the types of foods their customers wanted, stocking them, and figuring out how to price them. And they did it with an existing team. My mother and father, and then when we were old enough to see over the pickle barrel, it was us. And if they made a million dollars in their entire lifetime, it would have been a lot of money. But I believe, and still believe, that my parents were entrepreneurs. And they did do a startup. But their goals were very different from what we consider startups in Silicon Valley. Their goal of a startup was to be self-employed, not have anybody tell them what to do. And they did not wake up in the morning thinking they were going to take over the grocery business in the United States. Their vision was limited. And they were happy to be limited. But at the same time, there was no way they were going to be able to go to a venture capitalist, even if one existed at the time, and raise money. Money came from bank loans, friends and family, whatever they could save out of profits. So I just want to observe that small business startups are the, still the core of what America does. There are 5.7 million small businesses in the United States today. It's 99.7% of all registered companies. It employs 50% of all non-governmental workers are in small business startups. Now, what's funny, in Silicon Valley, we have a term for these people. We call them lifestyle businesses. <laughs> They're in a lifestyle. And some, some of you, yeah, you're a lifestyle business. All right? They could be people who are consultants, people who run their own you know, grocery store, hairdresser, carpenters, plumbers, small groups of plumbers. Ah, they're lifestyle businesses. You know what the real name for these people are? Normal. Right? Those of you sitting in this room are the ones who are crazy. Because what these people want to do is like live a life and then, you know, go out if they have some spare time, actually enjoy it. 
They didn't, their goal is not to work 24 seven, though most of them, or some of them, get trapped in doing that. But their goal is not to take over the universe or anything else, but they are entrepreneurs. I will observe that there's another group of entrepreneurs <laughs> and startups. And we also, if we're, small, if we're Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, we tend to diss these people too. It's entrepreneurship in large corporations. 15 years ago, a professor at Harvard named Clayton Christensen really nailed this definition. Christensen said, look, there are two types of innovation in a large corporation. One is sustaining innovation. That is, large companies start with a core product, and as they mature, they start spinning out innovations around that core. New features, different pricing, add-ons, supplementary products, and large companies as a whole tend to be good at this. Sustaining innovation deals with existing markets and known customers with known product features. But large companies have a finite life because of things that happen mostly out of their control. Competitors emerge, new technologies show up, customer tastes change, legislative or legal changes. All of a sudden, large companies are faced with disruptive innovation. And disruptive innovation requires them to come up with new products, new technology, deal with new customers, new markets, and new channels. The best example closest to home is Google, world's leader in search. They were going to own the planet forever until the, somebody raised the pirate flag in Palo Alto, a bunch of guys called Facebook. Holy cow. Google, which was a, the world's leader in your interaction with the browser, literally in the span of three years, found a competitor growing up in a domain which they had absolutely no expertise. Google is facing disruptive innovation and will do anything they need to do because they're a smart and innovative company, including acquire IP, technology, product, companies, etc., to go deal with this threat. But I just want to point out that inside of large companies, there are groups that are equivalent to startups today who are searching for a business model, not executing one. And then finally, by the way, the way you deal with disruptive innovation in a large company is one you try to build it. That is, oh, great, there's Facebook, we'll build Facebook inside. Look how big we are, we could do that. And I don't know if any of you ever wondered, but I always wondered, how come large companies get like tripped by their underwear at their ankles, you know, every time they try to compete. What, you know, they got like a gazillion resources. How come they can't compete with scrappy little startups? And the answer is Shakespearean and it's tragedy. And we'll be talking about this in the, in the rest of the talk. Large companies, once they get to a certain size, hire people to execute known business models. They manage those people on profitability and success in executing the model they were hired for. Large corporations don't hire generically innovative people. And I don't mean they don't have innovative people. I'll give you an example. McDonald's. Anyone ever been, anyone admit ever walking into a McDonald's? Okay, good. All right. <laughs> McDonald's in Des Moines, Iowa, and McDonald's in Menlo Park, California, believe it or not, have essentially the same menu. Imagine one day the Menlo Park McDonald's hires an out-of-work entrepreneur as the manager by accident, it's gonna happen one day, who wakes up and says, this menu's boring. You know, we ought to be serving pizza. Next morning, there's a line almost rioting outside the McDonald's because you can't get your Big Mac anymore. Point is, McDonald's doesn't want innovators in the majority of its execution chain. Somewhere back in Illinois, I'm sure they have a lab of testing innovative ideas, but 99.7% of employees in a large corporation are hired to execute an existing business model, which makes trying to do disruptive innovation internally 
10x or 100x harder, not because people are stupid in large corporations, far from it, but they were actually hired to go do one thing, and they're incented to do one thing. And here are these crazy people in the offices next door to them trying to say, we're not filling out the expense reports in triplicate. We're entrepreneurs. Just culture clash all the time. So large companies tend to acquire, not always, but often. They acquire intellectual property. They might require, uh, acquire talent, headcount, which is, by the way, why Google acquired 50 companies last year. Most of it for people. They acquire product lines, or they acquire for customers, or they acquire for entire businesses and P&Ls. Various reasons why companies acquire. So I just want to point out, so far, we have two types of innov innovators, two types of startups, small business, large companies. But that's not what Silicon Valley is about. Silicon Valley is about this. A third group, which I call not startups, but scalable startups. Just for the sake of making the point that when you do a startup in Silicon Valley, it is not, I want to grow from one to five people. It's, I want to do something substantive. I want to change something. I want to build something important. And typically, the goal is to solve for unknown customers and unknown features. And you start as a startup on the left, but your goal is to find a business model and grow into a large market and to grow into a large company. Startups search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Your goal is to go from the box on the left to be a box on the right, a company that could execute. A scalable startup is designed to grow big, and what differentiates it as well from a small business and a large corporation, is it typically needs risk capital, venture capital. By the way, anybody know what venture capital used to be called? In the 1950s, when they came up with the name, uh, they said, oh, yeah, why don't we call it adventure capital? And the bankers in New York said, you know, uh, <laughs> and they said, okay, we'll shorten it. Um, so it's venture capital. But when Silicon Valley says startup, what we're really talking about is not small business startups, and not large corporation startups. Does this make sense? Why it's really important is as we sit here in Silicon Valley, we all think we kind of know what the word means. You step out of this bubble, go to Washington, D.C., try to talk to legislatures or the executive branch, go to Sacramento, go to Nebraska. People have no idea what this is. They know what small business entrepreneurship is. Making sure we use the right words and also, as an educator, making sure we educate correctly. Outside of the United States, this is the unknown. Outside the US, small business entrepreneurship is what people think entrepreneurs do. So here's my definition of what a Silicon Valley startup is, which, by the way, just helped me understand what is it we're supposed to be doing. My definition is that a startup is a temporary organization used to search for a scalable and repeatable business model. That's a big mouthful, but pretty important. One is a temporary organization. My belief, there's no such thing as a 12-year-old startup. There's a two-year-old startup attached to a 10-year-old failure. Big idea. Because your job in a startup is to search. If you knew exactly how to execute, you just would hire the first 150 people as quick as you can. You actually are looking for something. And what you're looking for is a repeatable and scalable business model. The words repeatable and scalable should make sense, but the word business model I will also define as we get further into this talk. Make sense so far? So uh, by the way, if, have any of you been in startups? Yeah. So there's a secret memo none of you have ever gotten. Any of you venture capitalists? And no one's going to admit it. OK, there's a secret VC memo. Because instead of this diagram, you go from startup to large company, VCs actually know it doesn't work like that. You go from startup to transition to large company. 
I always thought, gee, okay, I get it. I leave, uh, uh, being a startup, when I find the scalable and repeatable business model. And when I do that, my expectation was at the board meeting, at a minimum, they were gonna pin a medal on my shirt, give me a handshake, maybe a gold watch, and parade me you know, up and down the, the aisles of the company with you know, throwing confetti, saying congratulations. Instead, you know what happens to most entrepreneurs when they, when they find a scalable, repeatable model? Board meeting kind of goes like this. The VCs, for the first time, first time, VCs who didn't even know your name are now paying attention to you. I don't know if all you know, but a typical Silicon Valley VC sits on anywhere from eight to 12 boards, right? So when they're showing up at your board meeting, they physically have to get out their Blackberry or, or Android phone or iPhone and look up your name. Right? Then they're looking at the sign on the building to figure out they're at the right company. Right? You see one VC, they see 12 CEOs in a month. And by the way, when you're talking about your board meeting, blah, 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 blah searching, blah, 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 you know what? They're kind of listening. They, they might be on their phone. But the board meeting, when you say, and we think we've cracked the code, and we have some repeatable revenue or users or something, all of a sudden, you got that VC's attention. Because for the first time, you're no longer a faceless mass in his portfolio. But all of a sudden, you are in an important company that might actually provide a substantive return in that VC's portfolio. All of a sudden, the VC is now looking at you in a way that's making you kind of uncomfortable. Because they're looking at you up and down and through the side. And what they're actually thinking is, OK, you got me out of the box on the left. But are you the person capable of taking me to the box on the right? You did great flying around the country. You did great you know, doing one thing on Tuesday and the next on Wednesday and something different and hiring and firing or whatever. But gee, you've just told me we no longer need to do that. What you've just told me is we've gone from search, where we're doing different things every day, to repeatable, where we need to execute. Now my question is, as the VC, is are you the guy or the woman? Interesting question. So there's really a box in the middle called the transition. And what the VCs don't tell you is you're going from search to build, to execute. And what happens in this build phase is most often than not, the founders depart. And that's a very polite way of saying, you're holding on to the door frame and the VCs are pushing you out. Because most first time or even second or third time founding CEOs don't quite understand, it's not personal. But right here, your interest and your VC's interest, which were aligned, have now diverged. Because VCs have a different business model than you. And their career objective is different than you. It isn't personal, it's business. And the business part is what venture capitalists want to see is somebody capable of bringing in scale. That is growing your startup to a large company. Are you as the founder capable of doing that? And more often than not, they bring in what's pejoratively called the suit, but truly is an operator, somebody who's an operating executive, who is actually skilled at doing this. Makes sense so far? Anybody ever encountered this? This is why. It's a secret memo you never get. And it's nothing personal. The bad news is, and I laugh about this with my friends who are VCs, how come you don't tell founders this? And they go steep. So imagine. I'd be the only VC telling you, hey, by the way, when you succeed, I'm going to replace you. Do you think I'd ever get another deal? And so this is kind of the dirty secret. And it actually does uh, uh, injustice to entrepreneurs not understanding this is a normal part of the process. The, the interesting conundrum is think about who runs today the most successful technology companies in the world, their original founders. Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison, Jeff Bezos, at least for the first couple of decades, Bill Gates. I'll contend they're the exceptions that prove the rule. 
They actually, and by the way, remember Jobs had to get fired by an operating executive he brought in to go understand this. There's a growth process that most founders don't actually go through fast enough. World-class founders actually figure out how to quickly, almost like a chameleon, adapt and, and learn a set of skills that most of us take multiple companies to go do. By the way, anybody know how many presidents Bill Gates went through at Microsoft? I think f at least five. And he learned from every one of them. From every one of them. Make sense? Just keep that in mind. By the way, as an aside, as I said, you fail if you stay a startup. So one of the things I thought I'd share is why startups aren't um, small versions of a large company. And this really is an interesting thing to process. Because when I started in Silicon Valley, I said, oh, yeah, I know what we do. We do everything that we used to do in our large company. We'll do here in our startup. So I'll suggest that that's very different. I'll suggest that's wrong. That in a startup, the box on the left, we're searching for a business model. And it needs to be found by the founders. Now, we're looking for product market fit. And we're looking for a repeatable sales model. And finally, when we ex exit the startup phase, we could start hiring managers. But in a large company, you're executing. And you become a large company when you kind of hit cash flow break even, and you're profitable, and you're hitting rapid scale, and you're hiring new senior management. There's something called Dunbar's rule, that 150 people. That's another major organizational shift. Anybody know why 150 people become a company? Remember no Dunbar's rule? Uh, it turns out that human beings can't remember more than 150 people. It's not exactly that number, but plus or minus, you're just as a human being. Uh, we're hardwired for that number. You've become a company. And when you become a company, your drive for profitability is hiring people who know how to do the same thing because you've already figured out what that successful model is. Let me give you another difference. Large corporations run on balance sheets, cash flows, and income statements. Anybody in the GSB taking the accounting class? Is it required class? Right? If you're running a company uh, and you don't know how to do corporate accounting, you're going to put, put the company out of business. I don't care what department you're in. You need to know that. It's the very basis of how we manage and grow companies. Anybody ever been in a startup board meeting? Now, I got to tell you, I was in startup board meetings for eight startups, 20 years. First board meeting. All right, what do we do? What we do is we show them balance sheet, income statement, cash flow. OK, great. What's the income statement? Say month zero. Month one, zero. What's it say month two? Zero. Month three, zero. But not only am I paying somebody to prepare all these documents, we actually think that we're, the board is actually managing something by looking at these numbers here on the left. I'll contend from now on, if any board does that in a startup, you walk out of the room. The only thing you need to know about numbers in a startup in the early days, day one, that it has to do with dollars, is how much cash do you have left and what rate are you burning it at until you hit the ground. There are other numbers you need to know which are much more important that you want your board engaged with. And that's the metrics associated with you trying to search for a business model. Here happens to be some for an internet startup. Your own will be different. But the key idea is you want your board engaged in helping you figure out what numbers should we be looking at. They ain't accounting numbers. You should be so lucky to have this problem as how to count the amount of cash we have or the amount of money that's coming in the door. And maybe you're the rare startup that actually needs to do that on day one. Most startups are trying to find a business model. And you really want your board engaged in a much different conversation. Are we looking at the right metrics? Or are we going after the right people? Should we be measuring something else? Make sense? Sales. Anybody ever see a large corporate VP of sales? Not a large, but I mean a, a <laughs> VP of sales from a large corporation. Anybody ever see one? Anybody? What, what do they look like? How tall are they? Well, they're about six feet or more. Yeah, six feet or more. What color is their hair, Scott? Well, it's generally slick back and a little bit gray. 
right? A little bit of gray. <laughs> and what's their golf handicap? Single digits. Large corporation, VP of sales, and we laugh about that. Those are actually good skills to have. Those are actually good characteristics to have. They're also not stupid. They're actually pretty smart, but they, they almost look in the United States like a type because they're world class at building sales organizations, making those organizations scalable, and having sales forces that could sell off of price lists and data sheets, and they operate brilliantly to an existing revenue plan. That's what a world class VP of sales does. And when you do a startup, my dream was always hey, I'll just hire one of those people. And if I can't get one of those people, I'll hire one of their directors and tell them they could be a VP in my startup. And that was always the fan. Hey, look, they did great over there. And I have to tell you, my last startup, I hired a world-class VP of sales early from Oracle. And I still remember the day. We had just got thrown out of like our fourth company we called on in a row. It's pouring rain kind of like a day like this, but worse. And like, um, you know, I'm shell-shocked as the founder, but I got this great VP of sales. And he's driving, and he's about to start the car, and I go, where are we going? He said, well, we got another call. I said, Jay, another call? We just got thrown out four times in a row. I said, don't we want to stop and think about, like, what we learned? He said, Steve, great salespeople just never take no, you know? They just keep going. And by the way, that's correct only when you actually understand a known model. When you don't know what the model is, that's destructive behavior. And in fact, those people, world-class salespeople, actually melt down in startups. Because this guy in our next week started freaking out when I said, well, this presentation isn't working. I'm going to make up a new one. And I was making it up on the drive to the customer. And it was, you can't do that. I know what the existing pitch is. Jay, the existing pitch isn't working. Well, yes, but that's the one we have. Well, I'm the founder. We can make up a new one. <laughs> Smoke would come out of his ears. And it wasn't because he was dumb. It was actually because he was great at what we had hired him for. And it was our, job, our, our mistake for not understanding the following. Titles on the right actually don't mean the same thing on the left. I'm sorry? I'm not, I'm not sure I can, but I will try. <laughs> Titles, VP of Sales, VP of Marketing, VP of Biz Dev. Well understood in a company that's executing. Gee, VP of Sales in a large corporation, hire the sales force, make the revenue plan, hey, you know, execute the model, sell off the data sheet and price list. Right? That's what a VP is. Take whatever spec you want in a large corporation. That's pretty close. In a startup, in the first year or two, that's not what the job is. Oh my God, what is the job? Well, I don't know. We're going to go get out of the building and figure it out until we like data sheet, price list, website. We're going to change them until we get them right. If you don't have people capable of operating in chaos, on the left, it explains why most of these people melt down when they hit a startup. Because even though we use the same title, the job descriptions, if we're honest, are actually quite different. Does that make sense now? Um, engineering, same thing. Large corporation, great VP of engineering can take a market requirements document, put it together in a waterfall development plan, hire engineers, and then at the end have a QA and tech pubs department. I could always now tell when a startup is in trouble because the first thing I ask is in the first year or two, so how many people do you have in QA and tech pubs? And if the answer is like more than one, it's a disaster. Because in a startup, in almost every case, you need to be doing a very different type of engineering. Waterfall development in a large company says, I spec the product. And I execute, and you'll get it at the end. In a startup, except for corner cases, you really don't know what to spec. And what you want to do is agile development, incremental and iterative development. That requires much 
different engineering leadership and talent. What do you mean by acquiring cases? So we'll talk a little bit later about the types of startups. There is a type of startup that's executing in an existing market. An existing market, by my definition, simply says you have a product which is substantively better as agreed to by the existing customers in that market, and you are going to take market share from the incumbent. If that's the product you have, then you could spec the entire product on day one. That's the corner case. In most uh, Any other type of startup, that's not the case. You're searching for right, what the right feature set should be. Does that make sense? And in fact, it's uh, uh, detailed in the book, Four Steps to the Epiphany. I'm not trying to flog the book, but just FYI. Um, agile development, continuous deployment, continuous learning, self-organizing teams, and you're going to ship not the maximum feature set, which is the goal in a large company, but the minimum feature set, or sometimes called the minimum viable product. Big idea. In a startup, you want to get to market as quick as possible, but not by offering every possible feature, but doing the exact opposite. Boy, that's really a hard concept. I want to offer the minimum features on day one. Whoever thought you could offer a smartphone without copy and paste? Can I remember which smartphone that was? IPhone. iPhone. Or who could ever offer a music player without an FM tuner? Anybody remember what that device was? iPod. Right? Minimum feature set. Right? We'll incrementally add features later as needed. But first, we want to get the product out and see if our core idea is correct. Last piece, especially for those of you in business school, large corporations love business plans. Business plans are wonderful in a large corporation. I know who the customers are. I know who the market is. I'm doing a product line extension. I could spec everything. And it describes a set of knowns. A business plan in a startup is a creative writing exercise. A business plan in a, start, in a university, I will contend, is only done because it's easy to grade, not because it provides students any use at all. It's actually detrimental to your career. In a startup, instead of a business plan, you want to spend your time working on a business model. And I will describe later what a business model is. But it describes unknowns and sets you up for what you have to learn. So as, a, as an aside, how do startups search for a business model? Well, the search is something called customer development. Here I've blown up that box of startup. And the implementation is called agile development. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about customer development. After 40 years, I think we understand why startups fail. Because more startups fail from a lack of customers than from a failure of product development. Now, this is a mind blower in Silicon Valley. And this goes across any technology except for biotech. Leave biotech aside. But hardware, software, silicon. We take more technology risk here in Silicon Valley than square, per square foot than any other place in the world. And you would think. Companies go out of business because engineering screws it up. The reality is in most companies, most markets, 90 to 95% of the failures are from a lack of customers. Now, for those of you engineers, don't feel smug because I've never seen a product delivered on time. Um, but it's not like the company goes out of business because of that. It goes out of business because of this. So I find it very interesting that for the last 40 years, Silicon Valley has had tons of processes to manage product development, but no processes to manage customer development, none. And in fact, the only thing we used to have is this product introduction model. Anybody ever see this before? You know, you see drowned, you know, product development, alpha test, beta test, first customer ship. Anybody ever see this? Come on. Yeah. In fact, I, when I used to put this up in my class, students would say, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, we've seen this. And I used to say, yeah, you know, even the waiters in San Francisco could draw this. And some of them used to say, well, we're waiters because we used to be dot-com CEOs. Um, and I said, so that I'd never make that joke again. So I won't. Um, but startups fail because of this diagram. This diagram says and enhances and convinces founders 
to make two major mistakes. One is, I know what customers need. And because I know what customers need, I could spec the product on day one. Right there. Now this is pretty interesting because startups are an act of faith. Right? They are driven by the passion of an entrepreneur. And so part of your passion has to be a belief that you actually do know what problem to solve. So this is a real conundrum. And the way I describe it is that on day one, a startup is a faith-based exercise. Truly, it's a passion. But the ones, the startups that survive, very quickly replace that faith with facts as quickly as possible. And that is, instead of executing completely on faith, well, I know it's my vision. They go, I know it's my vision, and I'm scared out of my whatever that I might be wrong. And so here's the process to check it out. And that's what we're going to talk about. But first, I want to remind you how startups used to work. You'd draw this diagram in your board meeting. The board would nod sagely, yes. And then you'd say, well, here's my marketing plan about what, what I was going to do in what order. I'd create Marcom material, hire a PR agency, have a create demand, have a launch event. Yeah, they'd nod. And here's how I was going to hire my sales VP. I was going to hire a big, uh, big sales VP from a large company. I built a sales organization time for first customer ship. Um, and then I'd hire all the all important biz dev person. And then I'll hire engineering from day one. Maybe my co-founder will do all this stuff. This is how you go out of business. I think it's pretty well understood that what boards used to tell you was, yeah, you got it. Good, that's our plan. Now actually is the leading cause of death of a startup. Why? Because you really don't find out whether you're right or wrong all the way until you burnt cash, hired a ton of people, and launched the product. So in contrast, here's how startups succeed. They do something called customer development. And this is where the founders get out of the building. Customer development says, instead of this product introduction model, we're going to replace it with something else. We're going to tell engineering to go do agile development, but we're going to create a process for managing facts. And that's a four-step process. And that's called customer development. This first step, customer discovery, gets you out of the building to test every hypothesis you have. Customer validation ensures your hypotheses are correct by actually getting users or orders that validate your solution. Customer creation is where we scale the business. And company building is that stage where I had labeled transition before. Remember where you get to leave? Maybe you don't get to leave anymore. You get to stay. And so let's go through a bit of it. Customer discovery says, listen, instead of writing a business plan, let's write down all the hypotheses. By the way, I use the word hypotheses because uh, does anybody know what current tuition is in GSB? What's current tu tuition? How much is it a year? 50 grand. Right? If I were just to say, test your business model guesses, you'd feel cheated. Right? But since you're paying 50 grand a year inside a business school, I use very expensive words. Right? <laughs> so you can tell your parents, I got my money's worth. But if you really think about what's going on in a startup, implicitly, you, unless you're a domain expert, another corner case, unless you're a domain expert, as a founder, you're actually guessing. You're guessing. And you're guessing about a lot of things. Or maybe you're guessing about a set of them, a just small set, but you're guessing. In customer discovery, we're going to say, guess what? That's a normal part of startups. But we're going to make you write them down and get out of the building and start discovering whether they're true or not as quickly as possible in a formal process. And you're not allowed to outsource this. Why? Well, what if, in fact, what if, in fact, you were a founder? You're a founder. Ready? OK, got a great product, your vision, and you hired a VP of sales early on. And she comes back and says, what's your name? Nathan. Nate? Nathan? Either one. All right. 
Nathan. Let's be formal here. <laughs> Nathan, I'm your VP of sales. You know, I got out early. I'm talking to these customers. You know what they say? The product sucks. What are you going to tell me? I'm your VP of sales. Uh, find, find, the custom, find the better customers. Find better customers. Great. So she comes back again after a month. and You know, I've flown all around the U.S. and I, I, I don't know how to say this. They think it really sucks. Now what do you say? So I fire you and hire a new VP of sales. Right. <laughs> and, and maybe there's a step in between that says you're just not explaining it correctly. Yeah. Right? Or they just don't get it. Right? And then you do exactly what Nathan said. You fire the VP of sales. Is it going to get any better? But how come the CEO didn't say, well, maybe that's true? What's going on? What's going on? Why wouldn't you say, perhaps that's true? Just believe you're right. Why? You're the founder, it's your idea. Why? Why would you ignore facts? Because you're, you're scared. Think you're scared? They're invested in what it already is. Right. It's an emotional investment whose consequence yes. ego. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes it's even worse than ego. By worse, I mean. You're so blind to your investment in not only time, money, but in the idea that there's a cognitive dissonance that occurs. And by the way, this is a big idea. It will occur to every one of you in the start. This is not anybody being stupid. This is human nature at work here. The only way to break this chain is the founders need to go out of the building. So Nathan, let's, we're going to pick on you some more. You're now the CEO, you're still the CEO, you're out of the building, and I'm a customer, and you ask me, what do you think of the product? You ask me. What do you think of the product? It sucks. <laughs> why, why? It still sucks, Nathan. <laughs> what do you do now? You go to the next customer, because you go, obviously an idiot. They're, they're not deserving of my product, right? Now, I will, rather than draw this out, it takes most people three times to hear it before smoke starts coming out of their own ears. By the way, it takes me usually five or six times to hear it, but I'm gonna say most people will you know, figure it out. You will never get it the first time. I guarantee you 99% of people won't get it the second time. It's kind of a bell curve. I was like on the, on the bleeding edge. In fact, what's worse is the greater your reality distortion field personally, the harder it is for you to listen. Big idea. By the way, if anybody's thinking about doing customer development, don't do it if it ain't you or your co-founders getting out of the building. It can't be outsourced because you will be hearing things that are counter to your instincts, beliefs, and whatever that you need to process. And eventually, you will process them if you're hearing them. I will guarantee you, you will ignore them if brought to you second and third hand. That's why hiring consultants to go do this, et cetera. Consultants can make intros for you and help you organize the process, but you personally need to be hearing that data. By the way, yes? Uh, do you have, like, so let's say there's two CS managers that start a company. Yep. And now you're first going to go, and you have tactically a couple of sales things that they need to learn. Yeah, go read the blog. There's a ton of it there. Okay. A ton. And there are lots of people who are writing about this now. But yes, and in fact, at the end, I'll, I'll point you to some resources. But on the blog, um, any articles? Yeah, there's a, uh, a tab on my blog called Startup Tools, uh, and it links to, uh, besides tools on how to build uh, uh, technically startup, there's a ton, a ton of uh, uh, links to other blogs that talk about this. Uh, by the way, our old friend, the business plan, sometimes rears its head here going, well, shouldn't I just be executing off my plan? Uh, I'm just going to say this one more time. No business plan survives first contact with customers. Business plans come from large companies. They're great in large companies. They're great for professors who consult for large companies in business schools. Seriously. No professor, I will contend, who actually did a startup can look you in the eye and tell you this is a useful document. And because we never had anything to replace it with, you know, there was no other contest to run. But I'll show you that we actually need to be looking for this, for a business model. As I said earlier, you put four professors in a room, historically you'd come up with nine definitions of what a business model is. Because everybody threw that word around like it meant something. Now for the first time, I'm going to show you what it means. 
because this is the work of this other book that I pointed out in the beginning, Alexander Osterwalder. Osterwalder had a great insight. He said any company could be described in nine building blocks. And I'll give you the cliff notes of the book in a second. He said, listen, first building block is who are your customers? What, are the, what users are you serving? What jobs do they want to get done? What's your value proposition that you're giving them? That's a fancy word for what product or service are you building? How are you getting it to them? Is it the web, direct sales force, indirect channel? And how are you creating demand? What kind of customer relationships will you have? And by the way, add all this stuff up. What's your revenue model? Don't tell me free. If it's free, there has to be a two-sided market, meaning, OK, it's free, and finish the sentence. And then we will make money by you know, whatever. And it could be, well, we'll figure it out later. All right, well, that's at least a declaration of faith. It's not actually a business model, but we could at least have that conversation. On the other side is, what key resources do you need? If it's a software company, you need great engineers getting scarcer in Silicon Valley. If it's a hardware company, do you need to go offshore? What do you need to do to perform it well? Is it manufacturing? Is it something else? Do you need any partners? iTunes without the record labels? The iPod just would have been another piece of hardware. Partners in some businesses are essential. And by the way, when you add up all the stuff on the left, what's the cost structure? Nine building blocks can describe any startup now. Osterwalder's thing was a stroke of, of, of genius. Um, and you can now take those and put it into a canvas. That is, you know, we just took that fancy nice drawing and said, hey, let's just make this a canvas. And now we'll take all our hypotheses. Remember those hypotheses I talked about? Your business is made up of a set of hypotheses. Let's take the hypotheses about your product. Who's your product? What's the market type? What's your competition? About customers. What problem do you think they have? Who's the customer? Who's the user? Who's the payer? Who's the saboteur? Who's the influencer? What type of channel? And you add all these up, and you can now use the Osterwalder business model diagram to actually become a scorecard for customer discovery. Remember I said get out of the building? Now you could actually say, how are we doing on this? Hey, wait a minute. Our first assumption of who the customer is, oh, that was wrong. Customer is actually over here. Wait a minute. Our pricing model, we thought it was a freemium business. No, it should be a subscription business. Boom, we could change that. Just a nice visual way to show us over time what we're learning. The goal for engineering during this time is to build what's called the minimum viable product. Minimum viable product is the smallest feature set that gets you something. And you get to define what that something is. Is it the minimum feature set that gets me orders? Or is it the minimum feature set that just gets me learning? I want to put up just a red button on my web page to see if I could get anybody to push it. Truly, that could be a minimum viable product for week one in a startup. Can I create demand to get people to this page? Or it could be, no, no, we're going to, I know what the core features of our website should be and are offering. Great. Do those. Or is it to get feedback? Or is it to test some failure modes? The first two things you need to be testing in that Osterwalder diagram is the minimum vi viable product and who the customer is. But remember, it's just one of those nine parts of that business model. And you're doing this customer discovery and validation and again keeping score with the Osterwalder diagram. Now, there's an arrow on the bottom called the pivot. This is actually the heart of customer development. And it's actually what we got wrong for the last 40 years of startups. Remember I kept saying startups are not smaller versions of large companies? Well, we never acted like that. And here's an example why, because any of you who've been in a startup are going to recognize this scenario. Startup goes through, first, goes through a launch, first customer ship, has a great board meeting. Everybody's high-fiving each other because TechCrunch wrote about your company. You know, people are hitting the website. Things are wonderful. Next board meeting, board asks VP of sales, how's the number? Referring to the revenue plan. VP of sales says, oh, that sales pipeline is great. Well, what does that mean? A website, it could be, well, we got lots of clicks, but didn't quite convert or in a direct sense. Could be, hey, no, we got lots of people to talk to us, but we're not quite getting any orders. 
Next board meeting, how we do it? VP of sales goes, pipeline. Next board meeting, how we doing? Pipeline. And by the way, the next board meeting, the, v, the VCs, unbeknownst to you, go to school to learn how to cock their heads at a 15 degree angle and arch one eyebrow. I mean, it's like just amazing because they do it synchronously, you know, like just in whatever that word is, but just all together at the same time. And they stare at the CEO. Really? Revenue plan? The next board meeting, you open the door, and I don't know how they do it, but there's a flaming sword of death <laughs> over the VP of sales, and no one is sitting next to her. I mean, all the chairs are on one side of the room, and she, she's like, she knows that the wrong thing to say is, but it's just, and you shut the door very quickly because you open it again, and she's gone. And it's just an amazing, <laughs> it's like a magic trick. It happens all the time. And by the way, Next board meeting, you open the door again, and there's someone else. Just looks like her, but it was a guy. You know, like, what happened? We got a new VP of sales. Now, the interesting part here, some of you might recognize this story, is that the new VP of sales, unless that guy and the CEO are complete idiots, does not execute the same sales strategy as the last one. They go, gee, that was stupid. And it was just because they were idiots. We're going to do another strategy. What happens if that new strategy doesn't work? Who gets fired next? No, not CEO. Must be a marketing problem. None of you are laughing, but it has to be a marketing problem. Yeah, and then we fire the CEO. What did I just describe here? What I just described is A, some of you might recognize the normal path on how we solve problems in a startup. And no one in 40 years recognized, wait a minute, this occurs mo more often than the case that we actually execute the plan pristinely. In fact, in almost every startup, it doesn't occur or it doesn't roll out per the plan. This is a huge idea. Startups are all about chaos and things not working like you believe. Your hypotheses are almost always wrong in a startup. That is, they're not often right. Yet the way we used to deal with this is by firing executives to iterate the strategy. Whoa, what a waste in time and money. This feedback loop, the pivot, simply says, being wrong is a normal part of the startup. Getting your hypotheses wrong is normal. So what we're going to do is instead of firing people, we're going to say, you know, we got something wrong in our discovery process. We just misheard what the market said, because we thought they said if we delivered X, they'd pay Y. Didn't work that way. OK. We didn't hire 15 people in a sales force. We haven't hired you know, 400 other people in support. Let's just go iterate. That's what the pivot's for. Make sense? Now, so wrap up. Startups are not small versions of large companies. Traditional big company planning tools fail. And startups are built on hypotheses. You need to test each one of them. Business models help you keep score. Customer development is the process to test the hypotheses. Now, I got about 11 more minutes. Can I tell you one short, more short story? You sure? Anybody wants to leave, you can. But there's one more st story. So why startups aren't run by accountants. Anybody an accountant here? I don't want to, like... Complete. You could leave now. Um, <laughs> anybody know who the inventor of the modern corporation is? Look at this guy. Doesn't he look serious? This actually is a real Time Magazine article from the 1920s cover. Anybody know who he is? Who was he? Yeah, yeah I'm glad you could read. Who was he? <laughs> what about General Motors? Who was he? Ran, good, ran, okay. Anybody else? Consolidated the, yeah. all the different. Yeah, that's what most people think of him. Alfred P. Sloan, General Motors president and chairman, he actually invented the cost accounting system for running large corporations. Corporations in the 20th century are basically possible because this guy took the accounting system that DuPont used in World War I, who was on his board, as you'll hear later, and actually applied it to making GM into a large distributed organization. 
put the managerial financial controls, and it was copied by every other major corporation in the United States pre-World War II, and post-World War II led to the American century in terms of uh, corporate expansion overseas. Truly a genius. <coughs> Lots of things are named after him. MIT Sloan School, Sloan Foundation, Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute in New York. Everybody know who Kettering was? Oh, another fact. He was his VP of Engineering, of course. Um, so, great guy. And in some classes, I get people say, well, yes, he was the founder of GM. Turns out, Sloan had nothing to do with the founding of GM by 20 years. This guy was the founder. Doesn't he look like a founder? <laughs> Come on, which guy would you rather hang out with? This guy, you know? <laughs> or this guy? Hey, this guy, this guy, we could have taken this picture in the streets of Palo Alto one night. Hey, come on, we're going down to the bars. This was Billy Durant. Billy Durant was the founder of General Motors. Billy Durant also was the leader in the United States in horse drawn buggies in the 1890s out of Flint, Michigan. Built the largest horse drawn buggy company in the U.S. One day, Billy Durant, sitting in the bar, he was in the bar, in Flint with his fellow buggy manufacturers. Probably Friday afternoon, knocking a couple back. And all of a sudden, they hear this noise coming up this dirt-covered street. And it was like the loudest thing they'd ever heard. And all of a sudden, they see this carriage coming. It wasn't, it wasn't even one of Durant's. It was one of his competitors. And it didn't have any horses. And somebody had strapped a one-cylinder engine to it, 1890s, and basically, you know, called the transportation. And the rest of his friends were hysterical because this thing looked like it was going to catch fire any time. Horses were running wild, you know. And, and they were all, up, Billy, Billy, look at that. Durant sobered up in about 30 seconds. Next Monday, he sold his entire business, got out of the buggy business, and started buying up technology companies at the time, highest tech companies in the 1890s, automobile companies. He was not a technologist. But this guy was an entrepreneur. And Billy Durant bought up a series of car companies and starts a company called General Motors. Builds it into the largest automobile company in the United States in 1910, and then is fired by his board. Because he's a crazy entrepreneur. Insane. Careless, reckless, etc. But he's also pissed. He's so angry at his board for firing him, he says, screw you guys finds another entrepreneur, and starts another car company called Chevrolet. Builds Chevrolet into a bigger brand and company than General Motors, takes it public, and buys out all the GM stock, fires his board, and takes over his company again. <laughs> Remember a guy named Steve Jobs? Who, right? Runs his company for another 10 years to 1921. GM is $3.6 billion in today's dollars being run by his founder, and he again screws up financially. This time he's gambling with the company's stock. I mean, cr clearly crazy entrepreneur. And this time the financiers he has on the board aren't some local yokels. It is the DuPonts. And they fire for the second time. Durant gets fired from General Motors, 1921. Company's $3.6 billion. Durant versus Sloan. Sloan becomes the icon of American management, rightly so, from the 1920s through the 1950s. The American century truly is the GM century. He dies rich, honored, and famous. Durant, he dies penniless, managing a bowling alley in 1947. He was the accountant. You are here. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> So I got time if anybody has any questions about God knows what I said, but um, any questions? Yeah. So what about the startup idea that doesn't necessarily have a $500 million market? What about a target that's maybe a 50 or $100 million? Same, your scale will start. I, I should have put the caveat that internet startups today are, you know, could have a $20 million, uh, but because they're valued at hundreds of millions of dollars. Congratulations, your scale will start. Does that answer? Yeah, that, that was the answer I was hoping. I'm sorry? That was the answer I was hoping. Yeah, and I couldn't have said that, by the way. I didn't quite understand that a year and a half, <laughs> uh, but I do now. Same characteristics. It's just that the, the, the space has allowed you to get in cheaper, it allows you to get out cheaper. Um, 
Yeah. So, Steve, I've been on sales teams in each of your three models. Yeah. Startups and transitions. Yeah. And every Monday morning, we have the same calls. Right. They're all pipeline calls. And, you know. Right. How, right. how do we. Kind of funny, isn't it? It's amazing. You know, what are you doing right. to drive the business this week? Right. Whatever. So, how do we change the model? Right. It's so, the same thing that you know. So, uh, uh, not even know what you're talking about. I've yeah. decided the only way to change the model is change the interaction at the board meeting from day one. So I'm writing a handbook for uh, VCs and startup CEOs about what we should really be talking about. Uh, here's what you ought to be asking your startup. Here's what you ought to be reporting to your board. It's very different. But, but the problem is we haven't had that handbook. And one of the other jokes I have with my VC friends is they say, Steve, if we were creative, we'd have your job. You make up the damn list. And I realized, OK, I'm going to have to do that. So that's my project for the next year. And did that resonate, by the way? For amen. Yeah, but you know what? If it's amen and we now get it, how come we're still doing the same old thing, right? Yes? Is, is, is customer development a skill set that you think MBAs you need to do to get into the startup where typically we're seen as parasites, where you're typically parasites? needing two um, engineers to start the company? Say this, so, so typically with companies company. right now we're seen as excess baggage or we're seen as being valuable once you have a repeatable or scalable yep. business model. And as an MBA who's not a technologist, yep. is, 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 is familiarity with the customer development model and the process uh, a valuable skill that you can bring to a founding team? The gestalt is a valuable skill. I mean, I don't issue degrees in customer development. The insight that all the classes you've learned about execution in large companies our excess baggage is the biggest asset you could take out of this or your entire MBA career. The skill, I'm sorry? No, I really don't remember what I said. Not, somebody else could repeat. But, but my point is, it's not that your MBA is useless, and, and I don't want to make that case at all. An MBA is one of the most valuable things you could have. Remember, corporations were around for hundreds of years before Harvard did the first Masters of Business Administration in 1908. Right? We traced the Martin Corporation to the formation of the East India Company in 1600s, right? 300 years before we issued an MBA. Do you think companies weren't running until somebody said, do you need an MBA? Masters of Business Administration was an observation is that we can now professionalize all the execution things we need to have. I'll observe that in the next 10 years, we will realize that we've now accumulated enough knowledge to create a parallel track to B school, which I'll just call E school which is customer development, agile development, business model design, user-centric design, entrepreneurial finance. Those are the skill sets that if I were to train you and give you a curriculum, you could acquire that knowledge here at Stanford. You just have to pick and choose. If you want to add value to an early stage startup, I will just again extremely claim that the large company skills you learn are detrimental bringing them in the first year. They are wonderful when the company gets to the transition. You're the guy they need. But if you want to play in the early days, you need to be able to be a you know football player and ballerina at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so it's unlikely that an MBA is going to become a Rails or a Django developer. But if we have to make a decision, does it make sense to become extremely well versed in the practice of customer development? A actually, so, so uh, you're going down a path I just want to uh, take an aside because this is a really interesting conversation for me. The rest of you could go if you want to. But the interesting conversation every year, because I teach in the business school at Berkeley and Columbia, every year I get at least one or two students going, Professor Blank, I need some help. We got, I got a set of job choices to, to sort through. Great, what's your choice? Well, I was just offered a job by McKinsey. Well, great, McKinsey's a great company. What's your other choice? Oh, my roommates are thinking of doing a startup. And I go, well, you already decided. And they always say, well, wait a minute, you didn't hear my rest. I said, you already decided. A startup is not an effing job. A startup is a passion. Nowadays, it happens to be hip and cool to do. But a startup is not a job. You don't want to take a job in a startup. Trust me, you don't, because you will fail. You want to be passionate. This thing has to be something you can't get out of your head. And if, it, and if it's not, don't go near it for the first year or two. And I'm not telling you it has to be that way forever. But if you want to be the first 10 people or 20 people in an early stage venture, it is not a job choice. Am I making, and I'm not saying that that's what you're doing, but truly it has to be, I can't wait, oh boy, this is exciting. And if that's the case, then the question is, what skills do I need to bring? 
right? And, and yes, your MBA analytical business skills could be immensely helpful if you understand their differences in an early stage venture from an execution venture. All right. Anybody else? Yes. And then here. Yeah. Thank you for a great talk. You, you uh, kept mentioning Apple, and uh, I'm sort of confused with that topic because it sort of does things like a startup. Yes. But by your definition, it's, it's not a startup. Yes. So Apple, Oracle, Amazon, etc., are one of the, um, it took me a decade to be able to explain those because they were the anomalies. So you, you look at them and you go, hey, your entire model really doesn't work. And every time someone would say that, I'd say, is that Bill Gates? And then change the subject. Um, <laughs> So really what's going on in Apple is just an amazing example that I think proves the rule. First of all, does anybody believe that Steve Jobs truly sits in a locked room and like, you know, Zen like comes up with a new set of features without ever talking to anybody? I mean, that's what your PR people, your PR people from Apple want you to believe. And I used to believe that too, because how can this, if that's true, how come, you know, how did this work? Just broke every law of physics until there's been a hint that no one's picked up. Does anybody know that Steve Jobs, at least when he was healthy, used to answer customers' email at least once or twice a month? Anybody ever read those stories on the Apple? Right? Jobs, it's a little hint. Do you think he's just reading those two emails he's responding to? Jobs is reading every damn email he gets. And I knew his VP of engineering. Jobs wanted to know every technology innovation going on in every peripheral company in the world. Anybody ever seen Jobs in the Palo Alto Apple store? All the time. This guy, it, it, he didn't need to go there to buy a computer. You think they would have delivered one to his house? <laughs> right? This guy is more attuned. And what he did, and it's a model for what these guys who survived, the founders, they hired world-class operators. That is, they're number twos. Are, with all due respect to Jonathan Ive and, and uh, Phil Schiller and all these people, are not Steve Jobs. They are world-class executors, executors. Jobs is sitting up here moving the chess pieces. He hired world-class people to execute that would have been world-class anywhere, but without him and my prediction, Apple over time will turn into a, another large company, just like Microsoft. Um, and I forgot what your question was. Um, it was just the fact that it's a startup. I mean, how can you come up with it? Yeah, so, so there are, there are um, individuals who manage to hire world-class people, but still keep the entrepreneurial DNA. And that's what him and five or 10 other leading up, um, um, Reed Hastings and Netflix, same thing. Think Reed is still running the entire company? No, he hired world-class people to manage underneath them, but he's kept hold and not let go of the product vision and strategy. That's what's consistent across all those innovative startups that are now large companies. Make sense? Last question. All right. Would you right. say that uh, customer discovery would uh, lead to more? Do you mean that through a business model? Uh, once you discover customers, then you may want to change the business. Yeah. So every time, so here's Steve's definition of a pivot. Remember those nine uh, business model boxes? Anytime you change one of those boxes substantively, you've just pivoted. That's that's the definition of a pivot now. Now, any time you change something minor way, the color or price, you know, price instead of price and model price, that's an iteration. Startups do multiple pivots and multiple iterations. And if you want to see some great examples of it, I teach a class here at Stanford called Engineering 245. We have students from the B school and the engineering school work together to not only build the company, but get orders in 10 weeks. Their presentations are online. They're now doing their final presentations. It's at E245, just look it up at Stanford. You could find the entire class online and you will see students doing this in 10 weeks. Question. One last question. Um, before we you mentioned the person with the, the job the choice in the and the You talked about your project on the next part and how you're trying to get No, it's just offline. Um, have you heard that? Other questions? Uh, all right, all right, all right, all right. So you mentioned uh, agile development. And uh, that kind of implies the startups want to be fully seen on software. No. Okay. Do you know who invented agile engineering and agile manufacturing? Toyota. Toyota. What do they make? Cars. 1960s and 70s. Now, by the way, the joke in Toyota was U.S. car manufacturers finally got to visit Japanese cars in the 1970s and 80s by putting pressure on Japan. They went into the Japanese car plants not understanding anything about agile. 
They looked at the manufacturing lines, and you know what they saw? What did they see? Chaos. Nope. It's Japan. What did they see? Really old machines. Nope. Robots. Lots of robots. U.S. car manufacturers, particularly GM, came home and said, we got it. We know the secret of Japanese manufacturing. It's robots. Next 10 years, they ordered $87 billion of robots from Japan. <laughs> Thank you very much.